predator race coming in and taking over the human mind. He uses the phrase, they gave us their mind. That is exactly what they've done, and I'm saying they're doing it uh, uh, via the moon. Because what I say in the book is that we are decoding photon information coming from the sun, uh, just like a computer uh, decodes the wireless internet. You know, I'm sitting in a hotel room here. It's got the wireless internet. I can't see it. It's just a room. It's in the unseen. But if I tune my computer to the internet, out of the unseen comes a worldwide collective reality that could be picked up in Africa, America, London, anywhere apart from you know, much of it in China because of the firewall. And what I'm saying is that we um, were tuning in and decoding and therefore expressing a much wider band of information, knowledge, and therefore reality, what we call physical reality, uh, holographic reality, I would say, then, then when the moon came in, it literally acts like a firewall, um, and it stops us um, not only... Uh, decoding in terms of uh, awareness, but actually seeing great chunks of this uh, universe. And I came a a across a, a news story just a, a, a few weeks ago um, in the um, New Scientist magazine, which is real mainstream science magazine in England. And it said this, that um, when they switched in America from analog to digital television. It opened a whole band of frequency which astronomers could see for the first time galaxies in that frequency range. And as a result, um, they had a, a race against time to get all the information they could uh, from, from that frequency range and what, what they could see in it before the uh, television frequencies of the past were, were sold off to mobile phone companies and stuff, and that, that band was filled again. So let's just take a deep breath and think about that. Astronomers, therefore all of us, could not see galaxies, whole galaxies, in a frequency band for, because Americans were watching the television. <laughs> and for people in, in, in Europe, well, still analog largely, yes, we still, we still can't see those things. And, and then take that forward and uh, multiply the technological potential by amazing amounts, because, of course, you don't construct something like the moon unless you are technologically light years ahead of us, uh, where we are in the, in, in the human world now. And, um, and, and think of the potential then for technology that would... Um, stop us seeing and perceiving in any way great chunks of information which we would normally be decoding. Um, and what happens when, because this whole moon matrix, as I call it, uh, is directed at the five cents body computer level um, of decoding. And when you are in that uh, state of awareness, as we talked about at the start, when your attention is pulled into that level of awareness, suddenly uh, you're in the moon matrix, and you can't you can't uh, perceive enormous amounts of things that you normally perceive, not just by sight, but by perception, by insight, by intuition. And so when we wake up and we become conscious, as I call it, we go beyond mind and into consciousness, you go beyond the moon matrix because you're going beyond the vibrational walls of the hack, the firewall, and suddenly you see things that you couldn't see before, just like seeing galaxies uh, they couldn't see before when the television system was switched, you know. So this moon matrix, and, you know, I, I spoke in, um, in New York um, last weekend, and I mentioned a movie, uh, a John Carpenter movie, you will have heard of uh, it, they, they Live. Yes. Yeah, right. That's great. Well, when I'm in England or, or other European countries, uh, I, I basically have to uh, often, but it's not so much in England now, but often I have to um, explain about the, the movie. Well, <laughs> I mentioned they live in New York, and there was wild applause, so I thought, well, I don't have to say much about it, but when I first saw that in the 90s, I think it came out in the 80s, um, it, uh, it hit me as being really, really um, important, uh, uh, profound, and telling me something that I 
really needed to look at. Now I've, I've come across what I call the moon matrix. It's taken on even greater proportions of, if you like, profoundness, because it's the story of how a non-human race infiltrated human society by um, hiding behind human form, which is what I'm, of course, saying these, these reptilians and, and other entities do. They're all absolutely reptilian. There's loads and loads of different en entities that uh, interact with the Earth, um, some benevolent, some neutral, and some uh, I don't want to go to dinner with, really, you know what I mean? But, um, but they, may they may want you for dinner. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't <laughs> taste good, though. You know? <laughs> I, 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 I want one who's vegetarian, you know? <laughs> anyway, um, and um, the... Uh, the, the the key to it was that in the in the movie was that the top of this television tower there was a dish a broadcast dish and it was broadcasting a frequency that was stopping humans seeing these entities and it was stopping humans seeing the mass mass of subliminal messages that were all around them because the the hero of the story uh, comes across sunglasses and when he puts these special sunglasses and when he puts them on he can see what you normally can't see so he starts seeing that uh, a significant number of people um, not the majority by any means but a significant number of people when you look through the glasses are not human and when you look at a like coca co drink coca-cola or vacation in jamaica or whatever these these advertising boardings all around us and also when he looked in magazines and papers he wasn't seeing that when he looked through the glasses he was seeing stay asleep obey authority don't question um, and this is what's happening to us and i strongly strongly suggest it's coming from the moon and i think that uh Taren, that in the next um in the next uh, you know few years we're going to see a few things about the moon which um coming to light and all the rest of it that, that are going to make people say well hold on a second there's something not right here well, and bombing the moon, I, 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 when they bombed the moon, I mean, people were saying to me, what are they bombing the bloody moon for? Yeah. You know, it was kind of, kind of all those bizarre things, you know. And it wasn't cheap to do, of course. So obviously it had um, uh, support right the way through the system. Well, I know you have an interview to go to, and we just have a couple minutes left. Okay. And I want to do this again because there's another dimension we can open up into. But I have to tell you that I've noted through the years of reading and discussing your work that the repeaters, excuse me, I mean the people who criticize you and your extensive work and research have never read your work. Exactly. And, and yet we live in a culture where they haven't given the Old Testament a tough time because people have accepted for centuries a talking snake in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, do you know, do you know, Taryn, I was invited onto a Christian radio station once by, uh, I think he was a pastor, mm -hmm. for a specific reason. He says, this stuff you're talking about with all these reptilians, mate, he said, it's in the Bible. I want you to come on and talk about it. You know, I mean, I've, I've said to some people who are of the Christian faith who've just dismissed this, I said, well, do you think the, the serpent uh, in the... Garden of Eden, which, which is a story repeated in other cultures around the world and using different names. Um, do you think there was literally a snake, or do you think it could be symbolic of something uh, more than that? You know, uh, it, it, but people, people, um, a they demand uh, uh, proof from others for their what they're saying, but demand very little proof for themselves for what they believe. Um, and, and also, they, they have these belief systems which they simply do not want to put down. I was um, here in, in a bar last night, just chatting away, watching the baseball. And I don't know how it came up, but 9-11 <laughs> came up. And I, I pointed out that uh, 19 hijackers um, who couldn't fly Cessnas couldn't possibly have, have flown those planes. And this guy said, of course they did, of course they did. I said, well, just explain this to me then. How, how come I talked to a Lufthansa pilot, German Airlines pilot, uh, of 28 years experience and he said to me there's no way I could do anything like what they did with those planes he said um, I don't care I, I said well just explain how, how they could have done it when they couldn't fly Cessnas I don't know he said they just did and that was it no. it was my belief system cannot move because if it does I have to reassess everything because I have to accept that the government's not on my side the fact that he hasn't seen that by now is just Really? Well, well, you are a shaman who is here to help awaken and remember. And, and, and in a sense, if we go back to the movie They Live, 
here are the glasses we need to put on to see things from a new perspective. And because as you put it in your book, and I love this quote, this world isn't man-made, it's mind-made. And, right. and I love that. And I want to end with, because I know you told me you had to go off to this interview, and I could right. talk with you for another hour with a, you know, yes, a snap of the fingers. But I want to end with that quote again. It's so important to remember because your last chapter in your latest book, Human Race, Get Off Your Knees, and your poem by Shelley, your stories, but the last chapter really takes us to a place that says, hey, it's going to open up. It's opening up. Not it's that we want it up. to, but the phrase is, infinite love is the only truth. Everything else is illusion. And with that, David, I'm thankful you're here walking the planet, and we just you know, want you back on... Uh, to visit the camp again and sit around our virtual campfire and hang out and tell some more stories. No problem, mate. Any time. That's an interesting point, actually. I've, I've been having some experience of that in the last few months, and which has kind of made me kind of look at things uh, in, and see how deep that is, because we can't change anything until we recognize what needs changing. This is why people hide things from their, themselves um, through what I call wishful thinking. You wish it wasn't happening, so you try to kid yourself that it's not. Nothing you have to do about it. And for me, I have this, uh, this line in my talks where I'm talking about it is what it is. Once you kind of are open with yourself and you say, I am what I am or it is what it is, then if there's things that need addressing, you can address them. But if you, if you are in denial of what is, because you don't want to think that a few people are manipulating the world to what they want um, as a, a, a nightmare kind of beyond Orwellian state, um, then you can not only ignore the fact that it's happening because you don't want it to be true, you can actually turn very antagonistically against anyone who's trying to point out that it's happening because basically you're saying to them, shut up, don't want to hear about it. And, and so you go over the top in terms of, you know, attacking people who are trying to get this stuff out. How many times do, um, do you react to a situation, reptilian brain, immediately, um, and then in a minute, um, two minutes, maybe half an hour, you go, I went over the top there, didn't I? What was I doing? Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. well, what you were doing is the reptilian brain reacted. Because whatever situation you were in at that time, you perceived it as a threat to your survival. And it's not, this is an important point, the reptilian brain doesn't just perceive physical threats to survival, it perceives threats to your financial survival. Am I going to pay the rent at the end of the month? It perceives the threat to your status in society. Is someone, you know, undermining my status? Um, it, it, you might be a, a, a professor who has a certain belief system that you, you, you get your uh, prestige from and someone comes along and starts to produce information that's undermining it. Your reptilian brain kicks off. You show me someone in the skeptic society, I'll show you someone who's oh, yes. reptilian brain dominated. Yes. Because I've debated with them sometimes, and when you're starting to put your view, which is at odds with their uh, view, which is basically mainstream science, some of them, their bums don't, they are going around the bloody chair, they won't stop moving, they're be, be, because they're hearing something that is challenging their belief system, and the reptilian brain's kicking off the survival of their belief system. So it's across the whole range and expressions of survival that this kicks in. And if we just, um, when, when, we're faced with these situations, just count to 20, count to whatever, and, and let the lizard brain um, die down in its react, immediate reaction, then you can think things through and things will be a lot, a lot calmer. A, a sheep runs into a field and says, hey, hey, guys, I've sussed it. This is going on, that's going on, that's going on, that's going on. And they'd, they, from the point of view of the field, they'd say, that's impossible. You're crazy. And by the way, you're getting on our nerves because we don't want to hear this stuff. <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and yet, uh, a little wide down the road, when, when the, the, the sheep's saying, look, they're going to bring this lorry. They're going to bring this truck. They're going to take us away to the slaw. Oh, don't be crazy. They'd never do that. Anyway, you know, it's not possible. And then the truck arrives. 